Psalm 113. This is praise to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise those servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who dwells on high? Who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raises the poor out of the dust, and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home, like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. One other announcement I failed to uh, make earlier, and that is that uh, uh, we interviewed Jennifer Kanzler for membership uh, last week, and so she will become a member of West Houston Bible Church. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we get started in our study this morning, let's bow our heads together and go to the Lord in prayer. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to make sure you're in fellowship with the Lord, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, you have revealed yourself to us down through the ages by means of the Scriptures. From Genesis to Revelation, you have given us a complete and sufficient disclosure of who you are, of who we are, of your plan of salvation, your plan for human history. You have given us a framework in the Scriptures for how we are to think about every issue in life, for ultimately everything in life was created by you. There is nothing in creation that does not have its source and origin in you, and therefore you thought about all of these things long before they were developed or thought about in human history. And so, Father, we come to your word because it is through your word that we are taught how to think as you think. And worship is fundamentally an act of subordination and submission to your will, to your word. And so we honor and glorify you by engaging in a, in a deep study of your word that we might learn how to think biblically and correctly. And through that, we might worship you by means of the Spirit and by means of truth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 and 5 should be taken as a whole. It is a picture of what transpires in heaven, before the supreme court of heaven, before the throne of God, as the, those who are in heaven, the creatures around the throne of God, worship God. We have the 24 elders who represent the church. We have the, the church raptured, resurrected, and rewarded. We also have the angels. We have the rank and file angels, but we also have seen the four living creatures who are before the throne of God. And we see them engage in worship. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 9, we read, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. 
The 24 elders then fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. We are engaged in a study of worship because what is embedded in this whole chapter is a view of heavenly worship that should give us the framework for understanding what the creaturely worship should involve or should demonstrate in history. A couple of things we have noted in the past is that the living creature gives give glory and honor and thanksgiving to God. These are three elements that we have in worship. Another thing that we noted last time from this passage is that it involves uh, doing homage to God because He is the Creator of all things. And so you have the emphasis in verse 11 on the fact that God created all things and by His will all things exist. Therefore, He is worthy by virtue of who He is as the Creator. And this is a fundamental uh, element in worship. This is why we sang a hymn this morning, number 59, 59, I sing the mighty power of God. What If you go back and you think through those words, they encapsulate a biblical doctrine of the creator-creature distinction. Sorry about that. The creator-creature distinction. I usually leave that in the car. You know, the most em embarrassing moment I had was I was at a church teaching and uh, the pastor, I had finished and the pastor got up and said, let's bow our heads in prayer. And I'd forgotten to turn off my cell phone and my cell phone rang. I guess the most fun was when we were having silent prayer in Connecticut one time, silent prayer right before, right before communion. We all bowed our heads to uh, have, uh, make sure we were right with God. And my phone, which played Dixie at the time, <laughs> suddenly went off and all those Yankees got, got a little extra education that morning. Anyway, back to our subject. We are studying worship. So we have to understand what the Bible teaches about worship. And last time we began this study of worship to understand what the biblical framework is in worship. Now, we, I started with, I have about 15 or 16 points that will probably expand over the next couple of weeks. Last week we got through point one, and we just touched on point two. This morning I hope we get to point four. I hear that. Oh, this is going to be a long study. It is a crucial study today, for worship has become a very controversial subject and there has been a tremendous amount of uh, work, writings, books from all kinds of perspectives on worship that have been published over the last 30 years or so. Some of these are quite insightful, quite helpful. Some of them are not. Some people have one agenda. Some people have another agenda. And as a pastor... The role of the pastor teacher is to study these things, be aware of what is going on uh, in the world around us, and communicate that to the congregation. Now, as we get started in this today, by way of introduction, I want to give a couple of uh, introductory remarks just on the function of teaching and how this plays into a study of this nature. One aspect of any sound pedagogical theory, any view, philosophy of education, or philosophy of teaching, is that in teaching on any subject, especially any biblical subject, must also take into account the current context in light of questions that are raised, contemporary practices, debates, controversies, anything like that. You don't teach the Bible in just some sort of cultural vacuum. There are all kinds of things going on, and people in this congregation come from a variety of different backgrounds. I remember some years ago, I was teaching on the subject of the, of the Christian life, just basics related to uh, fellowship, forgiveness, walking by the Spirit, why it's important uh, 
to confess your sins just to be in fellowship. And in the process of doing that, I was taking uh, a lot of time to compare and contrast what the Scripture teaches, what I believe the Scripture teaches, in light of a couple of other viewpoints. And specifically, I was comparing and contrasting it to one view of the Christian life that has come to be called Keswick theology, and another view that comes out in a lot of charismatic churches that generally referred to as holiness charismatic theology. And there were some people saying, well, why do I need to know this? Well, maybe you don't need to know this, but maybe the person next to you comes out of that background. Maybe there are people out there in the uh, audience around the world that are listening that really have issues uh, and questions and concerns. And there was, in this situation, there were two or three people in the congregation who, were, who had been raised in uh, charismatic Pentecostal churches. And they were, as I was teaching through the Christian life, they were asking a lot of uh, questions because they were completely confused by, uh, because of what they had always been taught about what the Scripture said in one way, and somebody else in the congregation who had always been taught a fairly sound view, and they're saying, why do I need to know all this? Well, you never know. Not only that, but you may be sitting there today saying, why do I need to know some of these things that are going on today? They don't really affect me. They don't affect my spiritual life. Yes, but you never know what you will face next week or next year or two or three years from now. This is important just in terms of frame of reference. Also, whenever you teach, and I find whenever I teach a scripture, it's important to compare and contrast what the scripture says with various views that are out there in the marketplace of ideas today because it helps people sharpen their focus to understand what they are hearing. There's nothing more discouraging as a pastor to have taught something biblical for a period of time and then you have people come up and, and they say, make some statement and you think, well, they haven't heard a word I said for uh, the last several weeks and that's because uh, sometimes just by saying a few things and setting a doctrine in the context of whatever's going on in the world around us, it just helps them to see where those edges are. It helps you to also think critically about uh, what's going on today. Uh, one of the things that I hear, especially when I come to this particular subject where I teach about worship and what the Bible teaches about worship and then begin to make application uh, to things going on in the world today is that people often make a lot of uh, unfounded assumptions about, uh, about why I believe what I believe on this. And usually, and I've, I've been involved in this study for, I don't know, over 30 years at least. And I've gone through a lot of changes as I've studied the Word and as I've studied a lot of other things and studied the issues. And I haven't always held to exactly what I'm teaching now because the Word of God and applying the Word of God and learning the Word of God is a growth process. And you, you, as you grow and as you mature in the Word, you come to understand that there are things that you may like and that are your preference at one stage in life. But as you grow and mature, you begin to realize, well, maybe that's not the best way to honor and glorify the Lord. And so we all go through those those uh, processes. I've been accused of all kinds of things that, well, you say that because of the kind of church that you grew up in. I'm always insulted by that. I've gone through a process over my life where I have gone back and reevaluated and reexamined, you know, every plank and everything that I was ever taught, either in the church where I grew up or by professors I taught at seminary. That's called intellectual honesty. Now, I understand that a lot of people may not think that pastors have intellectual honesty or credibility, but they do, they do at least good ones do. And I remember some, some 30 years ago that uh, I had uh, in, my, in my car old 8-track tape player. Some of you remember this. Others of you are going, what's 8-track? You know, that, that's, that's what they had, at, you know, right after vinyl. Uh, <laughs> now you're wondering what that was. See, it's just... But this is when uh, the roots of the contemporary Christian 
music and contemporary Christian worship got, uh, got, got, got established. And I remember listening to groups like Love Song, and I must have had you know, five or six different albums by the Maranatha and these different groups that were just coming out in the early, early 70s, and they were very similar to a lot of the secular music that was out, except it was, had Christian content. And this was, and then there were, uh, this is when a lot of Christian choruses were beginning to come in. And, and we would sing those sometimes when I was in seminary. Uh, I pastored a church in Dallas in the, in the 80s, and we had, uh, I mean, it was already established before I came to the church, but they had a blend, what they call now a blended service. They, we would sing two or three choruses and a couple of hymns, and it was a little bit of everything. And, and a lot of what comes today to be known as a contemporary Christian uh, worship and contemporary Christian music had its foundations during that period in the 70s and 80s. And so I, I grew up through that period. And when I was in seminary in the late 70s and on into the 80s, these were things that uh, we argued about, we debated about, we discussed as to you know, what's, what's right here, what's wrong here. Is there a right? Is there wrong? There's, the issues are incredibly complex. Most people don't, don't do that. They don't take the time to go back and investigate these things. I've probably put over 500 hours of study into this over the years. There's areas where I'm still not sure what, what the precise answers ought to be, but we, you just keep reading and studying and going to experts. I sit down and have had email contact with one man who's got a Ph.D. in music, uh, two or three others who have strong musical backgrounds, and we talk about these things, and we're always focusing on the Scripture. But you see, that's the other problem, is within evangelicalism, you're not going to find people who overtly say, well, we want to have music that's not biblical. They're all going to say that. They say that about everything, though. The issue is you have to learn to probe, to dig, to go beneath the surface, because there's, there's 20 different shades of evangelical viewpoints on just about anything, and everybody's going to claim to be, to be biblical. So you have to learn to think. You have to learn to study. You have to critically evaluate. And a pastor, above all, all people, has to be cognizant of all the various arguments and viewpoints and, above all, dig deeply into the Scriptures to understand how the Scriptures address every area. And see, that's an assumption that a lot of people don't make. And it's a crucial assumption that if God is the creator of everything, then there is nothing that we do in life that hasn't been thought about in the omniscience of God already. Music didn't start with man. It was in the omniscience of God from eternity past. Art, drama, literature, politics, law, economics, all of these things were in the mind of God from eternity past. These things aren't things that just popped up in history and God went, oh, isn't that interesting? So you have to understand that the Bible addresses every particular area. Now, the Bible's not going to come right out and say, okay, we're going to go to First Paul. First Paul is written to give us a biblical philosophy of history. Then we're going to go to Second Paul, and we're going to get a biblical, get what God says about the kind of music you should use. All right, and then we're going to go to Third Paul, and we're going to get a treatise on how, how you should decorate your church. No, you don't, it, the Bible's not written that way. You don't go to you know, second Isaiah and get a, get a scientific discourse on geology. What you have in the fantastic revelation of God is a framework, that the basic building blocks that provide the boundaries and the framework so that man starts with these building blocks and then uses the intellect that God gave him to build and develop. It started in the garden. Remember what God told Adam? He said, I'm not going to give you a handbook on biology with a complete ta uh, taxonomic list. I'm going to have you start learning. You're going to name the animals. That means you have to observe and evaluate all of the animals. You have to understand their characteristics and how this animal and that animal exhibit the same characteristics. So they must be of the same kind. So we're going to name them. We're going to identify them. And it doesn't stop with identification of, well, that's a giraffe 
and over here is a rhinoceros and over there is a dog or the various other kinds, then you go beyond that and you say, okay, what, what, how does a giraffe work? How, how, do they, how do they swallow? How do they get blood up into their brain uh, at a consistent rate? We, we've seen those uh, DVDs that Joe Martin put out on those incredible creatures and uh, the fact that here you have this long neck on a giraffe and the blood is being pumped up at a, pumped at a certain rate and while his head's up very high, of course, you'd think that the blood would have to be pumped with, with more power, but then he's going to go lower his head to take a drink of water, and if it's pumped with the same power with gravity, all that blood just going to, boom, hit, the, hit his brain, and he's going to stroke out. And Then what are you going to do? So, you, so the classification and categorization of animals goes beyond just, just naming them. It's a process we're still engaged in in and good objective scientific inquiry. Well, the same thing is true in every other academic discipline in life. It's true not only for biology, but geology, and then you take it into other areas such as economics and history and law. And the Mosaic law is given as a foundation for Israel, but it also becomes a paradigm of what a righteous, holy God considers to be law. That's why it's given as case law. It doesn't tell you what to do in every area, but it gives you uh, two or three uh, cases on which you can extrapolate how to apply things in other areas. For example, you have a law in the Mosaic Law that a homeowner should build a parapet around the edges of the house so that if somebody's up there walking around, they, they, there's a safety measure there to keep them from falling off. And you can extrapolate that in terms of common sense for various other safety measures. There's a lot of things like that contained in the Mosaic Law. And so the scripture gives us that framework. And then as part of the Amago Dei, the image of God that we all possess as creatures who can create, we are to use that creativity within those boundaries. And one of the interesting things about people who are more creative and less creative, some of you are that way, some of you are incredibly creative. Creative people tend to think outside the box. But what's the box? The box are the boundaries and the limitations. So you have this, this conflict with creative people. They want to go new places, and they, they tend to be resistant to boundaries. But the Bible also gives boundaries. You can be creative, but that creativity has to take place within a certain framework within boundaries. And that's true with worship. You have people today that talk about worship, and worship can be anything. And I mean, some of the extreme cases, you know, let's just go anywhere we want to go because uh, everything we're doing, we're creatures, we're doing it, we have the right motive, and so everything is fundamentally neutral. But we have to ask that, is music neutral? Is art neutral? Is there such a thing as, as neutrality, there are, are, is, are there ethical issues here? We have to address these. But our foundation is starting with the Bible. So the reason I address this the way I do is because, first of all, we have to understand what the Bible says. Secondly, we have to let what the Bible says impact our own view of what worship is. And there's all kinds of different opinions about what worship is, and we live in a world today where there was a major change that took place in the 60s. If you look at it historically, and that's another element that has to be brought in, why are things the way they are today and they weren't this way 40 years ago? 40 years ago, most churches worshiped within a certain framework, and they had done that with for hundreds of years. What happens today in most evangelical churches under the classification of contemporary Christian worship is something that, that came out of the 60s. Oh, what happened in the 60s to influence that kind of a change? Is that good? Is it bad? What were the strands of thought that were going on during that time? A lot of stuff that you don't find too many people address. So we have to do that. That's part of teaching. And I'll just weave some of those things into our study of worship as we go along. Last time I pointed out that some of the things that we need to, some of the questions that we need to address are, is worship synonymous with singing? That's what you often hear today, is in fact, you go to churches back, <coughs> uh, historically you had choir directors and song leaders. 
and you had the pastor. Now you have a pastor and a worship leader. Well, see what that subtly does by vocabulary? All of a sudden now worship is what you do when you sing. It's not the teaching of the Word. And so there is a shift in terms of what is important, where the focal point is in church. Uh, singing and, and praise and thanksgiving are certainly part of worship, but they're not synonymous to worship. Uh, what, what role does the teaching of the Word have to do with, with worship? What about things like you'll, I've heard people say, well, biblical principles of worship should be spontaneous. Where do you find that? Give me chapter and verse. What are the real issues that are related to uh, what is, as I pointed out last time, I think wrongly labeled contemporary Christian worship versus traditional? It's, it's, it's wrong for two ways. First of all, I pointed out last time because of the way they define worship. And both groups tend to define it, uh, I think, in, in a non-biblical way. But also because the battle really isn't contemporary versus traditional. There's a lot of traditional music that is shallow, superficial, and trite and self-centered that it came out of the revivalistic period of the, of the 1800s. And some of these are favored hymns by people, but they're, they're really not, they don't fit a biblical standard for what we should sing. And there's some recently written material that is also very good. It's sound musically and it's sound lyrically. But then again, we have to come to a point where we can understand what some of those uh, criterion are for making value judgments such as good, bad, sound, unsound. And remember, the focal point that we're going to get to in point four is uh, from John chapter four, where Jesus said that worship must be by means of the Spirit and by means of truth. That very statement says that there is right worship and there is wrong worship. It's not about are we right or they wrong or anything like that. It's what is biblical, what is consistent with truth. And as soon as you use that word truth, what should come to your mind? You, you all have been here. You've listened to uh, Charlie Kluss teaching on framework. You've listened to my teaching. As soon as you see that word truth, what should come to your mind? Exclusivity. This is a bad word in today's world. It's a bad word for a lot of Christians. Exclusivity means God's way or no way. It means there's only one way onto the ark. We, we've traced this through historically, that when God brought judgment on the pre-Noahic world, there was only one way to escape and survive, and that was to get on the ark. God, in his grace, didn't hide that from people. Noah proclaimed that for 120 years, but people rejected it. You can go all the way through the scriptures and see that God always defines a, his way the right way, that way which is truth with a capital T as opposed to man's way. And God's way, as Jesus says, uh, broad is the path to destruction, but narrow the path to life. Throughout the scriptures, you have this pattern that biblical truth is always narrow. Ah, but see, if you're really inculcated in contemporary thought, narrow is a bad word. It's a nasty word. You're just narrow. You know, you need to be more broad. There's lots of opinions out there, lots of views out there. No, the Bible is narrow. There is God's way of thinking about everything. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Three exclusivistic statements. And see, this just drives uh, unbelievers and modern man nuts because modern man wants there to be many ways to God. But the Bible consistently says from Genesis to Revelation that there is only one way to have a relationship to God and there is only one way to deal with the sin problem and that is to put your faith alone in Christ alone. No man can come to the Father except by me, Jesus said. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved, Acts 4.12. The Bible makes clear statements. It makes definite ethical statements that there are things that are right and things that are wrong. Those things that are right are those things that are consistent within that spectrum of truth. So we have to exercise judgment and discernment. Judgment doesn't mean you condemn other people. It means you evaluate things. And so you have to have a frame of reference for doing evaluation of anything in life, whatever it is. I got an email a couple of weeks ago from somebody asked a question they said, 
All right, we have Hillary Clinton and we have Obama. Now, what do you see, who, do, who should I vote for? <laughs> now, my response to that was, number one, I never endorse a political candidate because Christianity should never be made synonymous with a political position, a political platform, or a political party. That's one of the problems that evangelicals have had uh, in recent years is they, they've become so politically active in some areas that it becomes a distraction from the message of the scriptures which has to do with with Jesus Christ and the gospel and not politics not the Christian shouldn't be involved in politics and not that the Bible doesn't address it but you have principles and so I answered this by saying that there are basic principles in scripture that you must utilize to make your own decision as to the person you are going to uh, vote for. You need to, it needs to be somebody who, is, who supports legislation related to the five divine institutions, endorsing personal responsibility as opposed to uh, govern, government rescue. Uh, needs to be, that's personal responsibility, human volition, divine institution number one, divine institution number two is marriage. Uh, God has established marriage for believers and unbelievers alike, and it's between one man and one woman. It's not polygamous, and it's not homosexual. Number three, you have family. It's interesting to see how legislation has changed related to the family. In the 50s, we had legislation that was pro-family related to taxes. A family of four hardly paid any tax. But the same family of four making comparable income by 1980 was paying about 15% uh, ta uh, income tax on their income. That is taxation that is anti-family. That was legislation that was not pro-family. You have the so-called marriage penalty today. See, if you get married, you're going to have to pay more taxes than if you're single and living together. So that's a uh, backdoor uh, pressure on, on marriage. Uh, your fourth divine institution is has to do with government and the death penalty and execution of criminals and punishment of criminals. Fifth divine institution has to do with uh, national distinctions as opposed to internationalism. And, and then you have the whole issue of Israel and support of Israel as opposed to opposition to Israel because the Jews are still God's chosen people even th though they are out of the land. You have principles embedded in the Mosaic Law that promote private ownership of property, personal responsibility, uh, the, the uh, accumulation of wealth without government interference. All of these are general biblical, uh, general biblical principles, and so then you take those principles and you apply them to whatever the the political application is. But that's how you do this. You, you don't just say, well, this is my inclination, my preference, this is how I was brought up, this is how I was trained. No, you go back and you evaluate everything within a biblical grid, and it takes time to develop that as a believer. There has to be a lot of teaching and instruction because so many people tend to come and say, well, that's just your opinion. Well, I usually don't say anything unless it's probably backed by four or five hundred hours of study. Now, that you may still want to say that's my opinion. I don't like that because the word opinion usually implies people who are just choosing a personal preference. Now, it is an educated study, and if you want to disagree with me, then let's work through all the issues and go do some homework and not just have a knee-jerk response because that's not the way you were taught or that's not how some, you heard some pastor do it or that, that's not what makes you feel good. So we have to go through these processes of, of study and what happens for all of us as believers is the Bible's going to step all over our toes. It's not about doing things that make us comfortable. It's about doing things that are right within a biblical framework. And worship is no different. So we began the study last time. And we began by looking at just the Hebrew and Greek words. Uh, avad for Hebrew, just a very quick review Avad is one word that is often translated worship, and it has that word, of, that notion of service, that we are to serve God. Man was originally created to serve God as the administrator of the earth. 
He was God's vicegerent. Now, here's vocabulary time. I always get this. Some guys get about halfway through seminary, and they say, isn't that supposed to be vice regent? No. A vice regent is like a vice president. You have the regent who's the boss, and the vice president is the guy who's second in command, who the first guy uh, drops off the scene, he takes his place. That's a vice regent. A vice gerent is someone who is sent as an authority over something by the ruler. And that's what man is. He is the vice gerent. He is created as the pinnacle of creation in Genesis chapter 1, and he is to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. He is to rule over creation as God's representative. Uh, that, of course, gets distorted because of the fall and because of the entrance of sin into human history. But he is there to serve God over creation. He was placed in the garden to serve and to guard. Then uh, you have passages like Deuteronomy 6.13 we looked at last time. The second word, which is a primary word for worship, is the word shakha, which has the core idea of falling prostrate, to be despondent, to put yourself in a position of complete subordination to the authority of God. We have the same two basic concepts in the New Testament, proskuneo, which has the basic idea of to kiss, uh, to adore, to throw a kiss in respect of someone, to worship, to prostrate some, oneself before a superior. Almost the idea of groveling. Uh, Matthew 2.2, 2, we have this uh, usage of proskuneo where the Magi came to worship the young Christ child and to bring gifts to him. So that's one aspect of worship. They came to give gifts to him. And in Matthew 2, it states that when they came to the house and saw the mother and the child, they fell down on their face before him, and then they gave gifts to him. So that gives us some idea of what worship is. Another word that's used in the New Testament is latreia, which is comparable to avad in the Old Testament. It has that idea of serving God with our whole life. That's the idea in Romans 12.1 that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, that is set apart to the service of God. Every aspect that no matter what you're doing, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a school teacher, whether you are a... Uh, uh, a mother, whatever it is that you're, you're doing, whatever your, your job is, you're doing it in a sanctified manner, in a way that is acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So this brings worship out of the corporate area, which is one area, primarily how I've been talking about it, into the personal or individual area. So then we came to a definition. If you were here last time, you remember that it was a long definition. I've tried to synthesize it down to just a very short sentence, and then we'll take it apart. Worship is the submission and subordination of the creature to the Creator, to honor and glorify the Creator. That's the core idea. Worship is, includes anything that involves submission, subordination of the creature to the Creator. We ascribe to him glory and honor. We are thankful to him power. This can involve gratitude. This can involve uh, g giving offerings, financial offerings. It can involve uh, Christian service. It can involve reading the scriptures, learning how God thinks. All of these things are part of that concept for the purpose of honoring and glorifying the creator. It is a word that is used in a variety of contexts in the scripture. Now, here's the long definition. Now, don't try to write it all down now. I'm going to take each sentence apart individually. I'll read the whole thing first, then we'll pick it apart. Worship means to submit or to subordinate my, and I've tried to be pretty inclusive here, my opinions, preferences, thoughts, philosophy of life, finances, politics, emotions, relationships, attitudes, actions, time, priorities, to the authority of God's Word. It addresses every area of life. We have to subordinate ourselves to God's Word, which means that we have to exchange whatever we're, our personal views are for God's. That's Romans 12, 2. 
which follows 12.1, says we're to give our bodies a holy, acceptable sacrifice unto, a God, unto God. Next verse says, don't be conformed to this age, the thinking of this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind. That means it's thought. It's one of the hard things for a lot of people is that the Christian life is grounded in thought. That means we have to take time to evaluate our what's going on inside of our own head between our own ears. Thus, worship is a complex idea which involves a number of aspects, from private prayer to public expressions of thanks, and the singing of hymns and praise to God, which reinforce, the, we could, I could say, that reinforce the teaching of Scripture and reflect upon God, who He is and what He has done, His person and His works. It also includes bringing sacrifices and gifts uh, for personal Christian worship. Worship can be both individual and corporate. We may sometimes be emotionally stimulated by worship, but that is not the criterion of worship, only a byproduct. That's very important in today's world. That first part, to submit or subordinate my opinions, preferences, thoughts, philosophy of life, finances, politics, emotions, relationships, attitudes, actions, time, priorities, everything. That's Romans 12.1. To present your bodies as a circumlocution for saying to present everything in your life in service to God. Everything. Now that doesn't happen in a one-shot decision. That happens over time. And we all grow at different stages and in different ways, but it takes a, a long time to take all that human viewpoint stuff that's going on in your head and to take it out, identify it, and replace it with biblical truth. It also takes a lot of courage and humility to do that because when, as we grow up, uh, we, we adopt a lot of things that make us feel comfortable. They work for us. We're fundamentally pragmatic in our sin nature. But as we go through that, this growth process in the Christian life, the Word of God is again and again and again going to challenge us in the comfort zone of our sin nature that just because you like it, you're comfortable with it, that's your favorite thing to do, doesn't mean that's the best thing to do or that honors and glorifies God. Now, do you have what it takes spiritually, the spiritual courage and objectivity and humility to face the truth of Scripture? And we all go through that change. I, I've read a lot of stuff as I've been studying on worship recently where there are some areas that I think, well, that might be what Scripture says, but am I... I'm not sure I'm ready to, to, to deal with that implication yet. I need to, you know, validate that more and see if that's actually right. We all get through that. It's, it's a, it's a long-term process. And I've noticed that over the last 15 years that the more I mature in the Word, the more I realize that, that activities that I have enjoyed a lot in life, uh, and I'm thinking about reading. I grew up reading a lot of uh, science fiction. I enjoyed science fiction. When I was in junior high, I discovered reading and discovered Tarzan. I loved Tarzan. I had a couple of big trees in the backyard. I had ropes all over the place. I, and I, every Saturday afternoon, my best friend and I would watch the old Johnny Weissmuller movies. And I started reading the Tarzan books. But th talk about propaganda for Darwinism, survival of the fittest. I mean, that is embedded in all of his writings. He and H.G. Wells were kind of the grandfathers of science fiction. And later on in high school and later I enjoyed watching science fiction movies, especially uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, all of those. And in the, sometime in the mid-80s, there was an advertising campaign that Volkswagen had. Uh, and ran in Time Magazine, had kind of a fold-out interior leaf. And in that interior uh, leaf, they'd, they'd have a picture of a Volkswagen and a quote from some contemporary thinker. And they had this quote from Gene Roddenberry, who was a creator of of the Star Trek series, and he said, you know, one day uh, we're going to be at the point where, uh, and I forget the exact quote, but it was something along the lines of where there, uh, people who think that there's only one God or one way to God are as obsolete as people who thought the earth was flat. Now, there he has stated clearly that he has an agenda in all the Star Trek stuff that is anthropocentric and anti-Christian. 
and you watch from the very beginning those shows, you can see that. It is entertainment with a message. And it's subtle. I mean, there's a lot of entertainment there. There's some good stories. They were westerns set in outer space, but there's something else that's going on there. And so I've discovered over time, you know, that doesn't really entertain me anymore. There are certain books that I used to enjoy reading, fiction, just for entertainment's sake, that I'm not so sure I, I really like that anymore. That's that process. There's music. There were some, some of the better Christian choruses that came out in the early 70s that had scripture to them that I used to enjoy singing. And I don't anymore because I realize a lot more about that music than simply the lyrics. The lyrics are scripture, but the, there's aspects related not only to the music, but how that, this particular music is set within a broader context of a cultural shift that has an epistemological and metaphysical base and agenda that is ignored by most people today. Now, I just lost half of you. You were saying, what's epistemological? That means, how do you know this is true? And what, what's your metaphysics? And, and music, everything in life grows out of out of, out of worldview, out of philosophy. And we have to be willing to evaluate that and identify these, these various aspects. There is nothing, and you know, one of the things you notice in the, in the literature that I read is a lot of discussion on whether certain kinds of music are ethical or unethical or these kinds of things. And I have questions about some of that. But one question I have is I'm not sure that the issue is, is, is always ethics. But I do think it's worldview. There is nothing in the world that is worldview neutral. Nothing is worldview neutral. You change a culture, you'll change the music. Well, what makes up culture? What makes up culture are ultimately, what's the ultimate reality in the universe? How do we know about that ultimate reality in the universe? That's metaphysics and epistemology. Well, whatever we know about that ultimate reality in the universe is going to establish some sort of values. That's ethics. I mean, you got ethics in primitive societies, like in Irian Jaya, where you had the Sawi people who thought that the greatest uh, thing that you could do in life is to completely deceive someone to the point that they would, it would cost them their life. Wow. So the greatest value, the greatest ethic, is to be a liar and a deceiver and to be successful at it. See, everybody's, and that ethic grew out of their views of animism and spiritism and and how they knew about these things, it's all related. And then you have aesthetics, which involve art and music and theater, all of these kinds of things. And these things are all interconnected. But you, you will n rarely find a pastor who will ever get in a pulpit and talk about these things because everybody will go home and go, man, I didn't understand that. Let's go someplace where we can feel good. So <laughs> that isn't going to happen here. We're going to try to think through these things so that we can understand what is going on, what the Bible says, and that we can try to, you know, somehow conform our thinking to God's thinking. Thus, we know that worship is a complex idea which involves a number of aspects. That's why it's difficult to talk about this. It is complex. And it's, there's, the word worship is used to describe a lot of different activities in Scripture, from bringing sacrifices to just simply giving thanks in private prayer. It involves giving, offering, it involves a study of the Word. But fundamentally, it is all related to the subordination of our thinking to the thinking of God with a view to change, to conforming, being conformed to the image of, of Christ. And we get into the idea that worship can be both individual and corporate. There is the aspect of corporate worship as well as individual. And then finally, we must recognize that it's not wrong to be emotionally moved in worship. Isaiah certainly was when he was brought before the throne of God. Other, other area, times in life, others were uh, emotionally affected. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the criterion. It doesn't tell you whether or not you worshipped or not. It doesn't tell you whether or not it was better than other times when you weren't emotionally affected. And what happens is when people have emotional stimulation, even as a subtle criterion, what happens is the next time later on when, when they, they no longer become emotionally stimulated by that, 
They try to find something else because there's a subtle shift that takes place. Well, I didn't quite feel like I worshiped this morning. And I had a guy in, in, in one of my uh, church I pastored some years ago, and he would come up to me and he would say, well, I really felt like we worshiped this morning. I'd go home and kind of crank on that for a little while and say, well, wait a minute. How do we understand this? Emotion is valid, but only as a byproduct. It's not a criterion. Uh, some things that will emotionally stimulate you today will not emotionally stimulate you two years from now. Things that don't emotionally stimulate you today may emotionally stimulate. It's not about the emotion. And that's, that's a tough thing to deal with when you talk about the music aspect of worship. Now, I've introduced the concept of music, which comes into uh, Scripture a number of ways. But before we do that, I just want to clarify something. As a result of the definition, we recognize there's a lot of different definitions. I, I went out on the Internet, and I pulled down a lot of definitions on worship. And some people think that worship is what we do in church. That's too superficial. Worship is experiencing God. Hear the subjectivity there. How do I know if I've experienced God or not? Well, see, the Bible says that ultimately everything related to God has an objective framework. So experiencing God is just too nebulous and too subjective and too superficial. Uh, worship is feeling God's presence. Well, God is everywhere. So how do you know? How do you, quite, how do you evaluate that? Worship is singing to God. Well, that's true. Singing is part of worship, but it's not all there is. Or praising God. Praising God is part of worship, but it's not all that there is. Worship is making an offering to God. That's true, but it's, not all, it's too limiting. Worship is a form of prayer. Again, that's partially true, but it's too limiting. Worship is love. Okay, in what context? What do you mean by love? Is it sentimental? Does it involve personal knowledge of someone? What do you mean by love? There are people bandy that word about, but not a lot of people know what it means. Worship is engaging with God. See, that sounds good. But what does that really mean? Uh, worship is serving God. Yes, but it's more than that. Worship is devotion to God, yes, but it's more than that. Worship is ascribing worth to God, yes, but it's more than that. So we need to pick this apart and understand uh, these things a little better. Okay, our third point, which we'll go through fairly quickly, is that there are two broad categories of worship, corporate worship and individual worship. In the Old Testament, you have private worship, uh, Abraham worship God when he uh, brought Isaac for sacri sacrifice. You have the servant of Abraham worshiping God. When he prays to God that God would guide and direct him to the right woman for Isaac, then when he arrives and God answers his prayer, he bows his head and worships God. That's personal, uh, personal worship. It's private and it's related to the individual and his own spiritual life. And ultimately, corporate worship is always built upon the uh, individual worship and begins with individual worship. Point number, point number four is based on John 4.24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him by means of the spirit and by means of truth. I'm going to break this into a couple of different points because, first of all, I want to talk about the fact that it's by means of truth. That means it's exclusive. There's right worship and wrong worship. And when people come along and say, well, I think we can do this form of worship, we have to be able to have some criteria to evaluate that. Well, that's what, what we do with, with Scripture. And there's, there's wrong worship. Cain brought the produce of the field in Genesis chapter 4 as an offering to God. Abel brought a sacrifice of a lamb. Cain really got angry because God accepted Abel's sacrifice but rejected Cain's sacrifice. See, Cain felt good about his worship, but it was not valid. It was wrong. There is wrong worship and there is right worship. Right worship has to do with the fact that it is truly uh, biblical. In Leviticus chapter 10, we have the story of two of, uh, of uh, Aaron's sons. 
Nadab and Abihu who are to serve in the tabernacle, but they bring a, a incense burner of the wrong kind of incense. It, they, they were defining what worship was for them, but when they brought it into the tabernacle, God took their life instantly because it violated his instructions. Worship in the scriptures is exclusive. There is right worship and there is uh, wrong worship. So our conclusion is that like everything else within the framework of scripture, we must understand that worship is exclusive. There is right worship and there is wrong worship. But having said that, and nearly everybody will agree that's true, it's how do we come up with criteria to define what is right and what is wrong? Because that's where the disagreement is. So we have to delve into the scriptures a little more in order to understand those particular things. So our the fourth point begins that those who worship God must worship him by means of the spirit and by means of truth. Later on, we'll deal with the phrase by means of of the Spirit, what that means. That's unique to the church age. But this begins to get us started down this path, and we need to look at some biblical examples next time to see how worship developed in Israel and in the New Testament, because this is foundational to understand anything that we're going to say about, about worship. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we have this opportunity to to study these things in Scripture, that worship is a vital part of spiritual life. It is a vital part of uh, spiritual growth because worship is the expression of that which is going on inside of us. It is related to our orientation to your authority, our willingness and desire to submit and subordinate our, our preferences, our likes, our dislikes, our values to your values and to the absolutes of Scripture and trying to work our way through what, whatever personal preferences or prejudice we might have one way or another. Father, ultimately all worship is centered upon you because of who you are and also because of what Jesus Christ did in history. The worship we're studying in, Rome, in Revelation 4 and 5 is related to the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb of God, worthy to receive glory and honor and power because He gave his blood for us. He died on the cross for us. He is the one who paid the sin penalty. Father, we pray for anyone here this morning that is unsure of their eternal destiny or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that sure and certain. That comes only from the certainty of God's word. They that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will have eternal life. It's stated very clearly in numerous passages by the Lord Jesus Christ, by Paul, by many other writers of Scripture, that we are to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and we will be saved. This is your opportunity to put your faith alone in Christ alone, not to rely upon anything else, but only upon him for your eternal life. Father, we pray that you would challenge us with the things we study today, that we might move forward in our congregation with a biblical understanding of worship. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.